Well, first of all, before starting, I would like to thank to the organizers for inviting me to do this lecture, especially uh, thanks to Alba and Sofia. Uh, as Sophie said, my name is Anna. I am and I am currently working in the uh, research group of cognitive neuroscience in the University of Algarve. Today, I'm going to present part of my research about foreign language learning and concretely the part that they speak about the role of gestures as tool to learn a new language. As you can see, the title of this presentation is gestures as a scaffolding to learn vocabulary in a foreign language. I have divided the presentation in four main parts. First of all, I am going to do a brief introduction. After that, I am going to present the theoretical baseline that I consider super important to understand this series of experiments. First, I am going to speak a little bit about how it is the uh, foreign language processing in novel and expert bilinguals. And then I will start with uh, to speak briefly also about for the different foreign language learning strategies. In part three is where I am going to present my series of experiments about gestures as for a language learning tool. I am going to present a total of three experiments. Experiments one and two uh, are for one of my papers. And in experiment three, I am going to present the results of a different study. Finally, I will end up this session with general discussion and conclusions. But before starting, uh, I would like to do a little experiment to do this kind of more dynamic. And we will see the result of this experiment at the end of the session. Uh, in the next slide, you are going to see a person in the center. This person will, is going to do a gesture. And you will see two words in the screen in this way. Here you have a person who is going to perform a gesture. You are going to see here the English word and here the translation in an artificial language, which is BIMI. This is an artificial script that uh, we use in our experiments. So here you have the word in English, the word in BIMI, and the person is going to do a gesture. What I want you to do, I will ask you to do, is to imitate the gesture the person is going to do on the screen twice, at the same time, you also repeat the pair of words on the screen, also twice. Let's do the first one, okay? This will be shampoo tola, shampoo tola. Scissors la move, scissors la move. Guitar foine, guitar foine. Carle nope, carle nope. Come on, everybody. <laughs> we are going to repeat the game. Shampoo tola, shampoo tola. Second one, scissors la move, scissors la move. Guitar foine, guitar foine. Carle nope, carle nope. And last time, shampoo tola, shampoo tola. Scissors la move, scissors la move. Guitar foine, guitar foine. Carle nope, carle nope. That's all. <laughs> we will see what happened at the end of the session. Well, now I'm going to start with the introduction and I would like to start with a question for all of you. Do you consider you are, when I talk about bilingualism, it's the same as I am talking about multilingualism, okay? So do you think you are bilinguals or multilinguals? Or, uh, and another question, what is for you being bilingual or multilingual? I'm going to let you only 10 seconds to think about your opinion about these questions. Please think about it for a moment. Okay, when I do these questions, 
in my presentations, sometimes people say that they don't consider they are uh, bilinguals or monolinguals because they don't have a total control of the foreign language. And this is a big mistake because the bilingual don't need to have a perfect control of the foreign language and the bilingual can know more or less this second language. In fact, today, you know, the ones of you who uh, do research on bilingualism, one of the most difficult things to do nowadays is to find a monolingual person, to find monolingual population, because uh, even if we are not aware, we are exposed to languages in our daily life. Okay. Of course, um, my bilingualism will not be the same as the one of another person who has been exposed to a second language or another language since birth. To illustrate all these differences, we have a classification of the different types of bilingualism. For instance, a monolingual person will be my grandmother. She had never been exposed to a second language. She is a Spanish monolingual person. I guess she probably uh, did, didn't know any word in English. Then in the second point in this continuum of bilingualism, we have the dominant bilinguals. This is what uh, most of we are, because we, our mother language is more dominant than our foreign languages. And finally, we have the balanced bilinguals that will be the ones which are exposed to the different languages since birth. They have a balanced control between all the languages, with all their languages. So we can consider ourselves as bilinguals, even if we don't have a total control of the language. And due to this dominant state that we have, we are going to commit this kind of mistakes along our life, and we cannot avoid it. Probably I have done some of these mistakes in my speech, and I will continue doing it. For instance, she played football, he had lunch with his family, or I didn't like the story. Okay, now I'm going to introduce the, the specific topic a little bit more. Uh, you have been probably in a class similar to this one in the school, the high school, at the university, or even in language academies. And in English class or other language class, you have seen this type of material. I guess you recognize it. This is a list, okay? Um, when we are exposed to a new language, when we try to learn, we go, when we go to language classes, we are going to be exposed to this kind of material. We cannot avoid them. Uh, we are going to study lists and lists, of course, and lists. Lists are going to surround us and they can even drive us crazy. It is terrible to study a language with these lists. Nowadays, it's, commonly, uh, it's common to hear, or it, it is commonly accepted in research that immersion programs seem to be the best option if we want to acquire a new language. Um, immersion programs consist in going to another country to be immersed uh, with uh, people who speak this language. And this will be, expo this will be called linguistic immersion program. There are also, for instance, language courses in which you are immersed. And sometimes this experience can be also included in language camps, for instance. In these camps, uh, it is prohibited to use your mother language and you can only speak in the target language, even if you are surrounded by people uh, that speak your own language uh, because you are in your own, in your own country. Um, in this way, uh, this uh, creates a false sense of being in an artificial, this is an artificial immersion, is a false sense of being in another country. Unfortunately, although it seems the, it, the, that this is the best option to acquire a new language, these options are not always available for everybody. Uh, due to economic reasons, time reasons, work reasons, it is not always possible. For this reason, researchers are looking for methods able to enhance this foreign language learning process 
in L1 speaking context. And now I am going to start with the introduction of the theoretical baseline of my studies. As you probably know, the world, you probably, you, you know it, <laughs> the world is continuously changing and we have to adapt ourselves to those changes we have to change to. Specifically, societies are in constant development and we are going to be involved in multicultural contexts. Due to this multicultural richness as a consequence, it is more and more necessary every day to speak more than one language. It is necessary to acquire foreign languages. The first thing that I need you to understand um, is how it works, the bilingual brain, and how we manage with our languages in different stages of foreign language acquisition. You probably recognize this model of bilingual uh, linguistic processing, but I am going to insist on this idea today because I need you to have this information in mind to understand my experiments and also my results. This is the revised hierarchical model. It was proposed by Kroll and Stewart. By Kroll and Stewart in 1994. And this is a theoretical and a psycholinguistic model about linguistic language processing. Let's talk first about the processing in novice learners, the uh, left part of the slide. As you can see, we have three boxes, the L1 box, L2 box, and the semantic system. In the L1 and L2 boxes is where we store all the lexical information about our languages. As you can see, the uh, box for the L1 lexicon is bigger than the box for, for the second language lexicon. And this is because when we are learning a language, we have much more, uh, many more words in our first language than in our second language. Then, as you can see, these two boxes are interconnected by two arcos. What does it mean? This represents the type of connections which are needed to translate from the L1 to the L2 or vice versa. The arrow going from the L1 to the L2 is thinner, is weaker than the other. And this is because uh, for a novice learner, it is more difficult to translate from the L1 to the L2, which is called forward translation direction, than from the L1 to the, from the L2 to the L1, which is called the backward translation direction. And we are going to see it better with an example. If we just learned that the German word for dog is hand, when we perform a translation task, it will be easier for us if the second word in if the second language word hand is presented for the translation. If the L1 word is presented, it will be more difficult to remember the correct translation in the new language we are learning, German. I think this is clear and uh, we can perfectly find this effect in laboratories we, when we test participants. But I would like you to think in your own case, if it is easier for you to translate in the forward direction or in the backward direction. So novice learners will respond better when they do the backward translation direction, when hand in this case is presented to translate it to remember the translation, which is dog in English. Then following with the novice learners, we have this third box. This is the semantic storage. This is where all the conceptual information is stored. stored. But the L1 and the L2 words share are going to share the same storage of conceptual information. So both access the same uh, semantic information. The arrow uh, connecting the L2 words with the semantic information is thinner because when, uh, when we are learning a new language, these connections are weaker. And this will cause that when we have to access the semantic information of a new word in our example, hand, when we have to access semantic information, we 
when we are novice learners, we are going to remember the translation in the first language and then only then we will access the semantic system. Okay. Um, the connections between, of course, the connections between the L1 word and the semantic system are very strong because we are talking about our first language lexicon and our semantic story. So this arrow, these connections are going to be uh, stronger. Now we are going to move to the uh, right part of the slide. This is the processing in expert bilinguals. And it is much easier. As you can see, here we have again the three boxes, but there are some differences. As you can see, the size of the arrows is balanced between the languages in the connections with the semantic system. This is because a fluent bilingual uh, have um, a, as uh, easy access to the semantic information from the L1 words and from the L2 words. And the other difference, see, the other, the other difference is that uh, the box corresponding to the second language is as big as the uh, L1 box. So we are going to have a balanced number of words in both our first and our foreign language. So a fluent bilingual will uh, stop translating, going from the L1 and from the L2 to translate the L1 and accessing the semantic system. A fluent bilingual and expert bilingual is not going to do it anymore because the reliance in the lexical links, these connections between lexicons will decrease while the reliance in the semantic connections increase these connections between the second language words and the semantic system, as I said, become a stronger. So at this point, I hope this information is clear about how it is the processing, the linguistic processing in novice and expert bilinguals. And let's talk about uh, a little bit about foreign language learning strategies. Uh, if we know that If we know that uh, expert bilinguals have a strong connections between the foreign language lexicon and the semantic system, uh, to implement learning programs able to strengthen concretely this type of connection will be a good learning strategy. In this uh, previous research have confirmed that the acquisition of these types uh, of connection, this type of connections is fostered by the use of training programs that involve semantic processing. And on the one hand, gestures have been proposed as a good learning strategy because a speech and movements interact and they produce an integrated representation of the new words in memory. So, we have words, we have the movements, and we integrate it together uh, in memory. Then in a second uh, research line, I based uh, my investigation on the comparison between lexical and semantic learning methods. But today I am not going to speak about this part. I'm going to speak only about the series of studies addressing the role of gestures as foreign language learning tool. Okay, I have finished the introduction and the theoretical baseline. I hope everything is clear. And now I'm going to start with the experimental section. As I said, we are going to explore uh, the role of gestures as foreign language learning tool. Previous studies have demonstrated the, the role of iconic gestures in language comprehension and production. Performing gestures, uh, while learning um, produce a facilitation effect due to the creation of multimodal connections. Because as I said, we are integrating new words with movements. This will create multimodal connections that helps, uh, help in the learning process. And hence it is widely assumed that gestures should be used in foreign language learning or foreign language teaching. Taking into account the uh, relevant influence that gestures seem to have in the acquisition of a new language, 
it is important to know which ones. It is important to ask about which are the mechanisms underlining this facilitation in the learning process. And well, there are three theoretical approaches in cognitive psychology that try to explain the positive effect that gestures have in foreign language acquisition. The first one is the self-involvement account. This theory posits that gestures enhance the involvement of the participant in the learning task. So it will be this increment in the attentional and the perceptual processes, the, we, the ones which will be on the base of the learning facilitation. Then the second theory is the motor trace theory. Uh, here, this theory suggests that the physical component of the gesture is coded during the learning process. And this uh, physical component will create a motor trace in memory. Here, the most important thing is that the gesture performed but, uh, is uh, familiar to the participant because it will create uh, a motor trace in memory. Finally, we have the motor imaginary account. This theory posits that gestures create a mental image of the action associated with the word's meaning. And here the meaning is super important because this theory uh, indicates that uh, the most important thing is to have a gesture which is congruent with the meaning of the word. So, summing up, each one of those theories explains the enactment effect, this facilitation in the learning process based on different processes. The self-involvement account says that the most important thing is, to in, is the increase in attentional and perceptual resources. So if a person is performing gestures while, while they are learning, they will uh, pay more attention and they will increase the perceptual resources. The motor trace theory. For this theory, the most important thing is to perform, as I said, gestures which are familiar to the participants. And finally, the motor imagery account say that the most important thing is to have uh, to uh, have a match between the gesture and the word meaning. In addition, most of research evaluating the impact of gestures have used verbs as learning material. And it, seem, it seems obvious if we consider that uh, gestures and verbs have uh, a clear um, motor component in its semantics. So there is a more direct mapping between the gestures and the semantic characteristics of verbs. However, we know that in general, nouns are easier to learn than verbs. This is something uh, that can be observed in different experiments, although more of, most of them have been done on, on children, with children population. So, and in addition, following the normal uh, language development, we know that nouns are first acquired compared to other type of, uh, of um, words, as for instance, the verbs. Another topic of interest in this role of gestures in foreign language acquisition is uh, the comparison between learning by doing and learning by observation. The learning by doing theory posits that the active participation of the individual during the learning process affects neural networks underlining the acquisition of knowledge. The active participation of the individual will be then beneficial will have beneficial effects in many fields. In previous studies, uh, movements have favored the foreign language acquisition process. It has been proven. However, it has been also, also observed that the pattern of activation is similar in participants which are only observing the gestures and when they are producing them. So the same pattern of activation is uh, observed when we are doing the uh, action and when we are somebody else performing the action. So it is not clear if uh, self-performed movements will have an additional benefits to the mere observation of these gestures. 
Then, well, here we have uh, our research questions um, to investigate uh, first uh, the first research question and the uh, second one, we are going to respond them in experiments one and two. The first one, uh, the first thing that we wanted to do is to evaluate the th different theoretical perspectives on the role of gestures. If you remember, uh, these uh, three theoretical approaches that try to explain the role of gestures in, uh, for uh, in the facilitation effect of uh, the role of gestures in this facilitation uh, in the learning process. To do that, to evaluate these theoretical models, we designed four gesture conditions manipulating the relationship between the meaning of the gesture and the meaning of the word. So we had a congruent, incongruent, meaningless, and a no gesture condition, total of four. We will see what does it mean in, uh, in, in the next slides. In, and the second research question that we are going to respond also in experiments one and two is uh, this thing about if it is easier to speak, uh, to learn gnomes and verbs, and if verbs, if gestures will be especially beneficial to learn new verbs. So we are going to address these two questions in experiments one and two. Experiments one and two uh, were already published in Applied Psycholinguistics with the title Learning Known Numbers in a Foreign Language, The Role of Gestures. So at this point, I'm going to start presenting the experiments. Here you have information about the method we used. Uh, as participants, we had a Spanish monolinguals. Remember this thing I told you about uh, looking for monolingual participants. Uh, uh, these participants were not super pure uh, monolinguals because they were exposed to uh, more languages in school and high school, but we control uh, that they had uh, as less exposure to the second language to any language apart from Spanish in their daily life with a questionnaire. Then in experiment one, we had a total of 25 participants and in experiment two, we had uh, 32. As language, the language or participants, or participants learn, the foreign language was BIMI. As I said at the beginning, it is an artificial script. So we had uh, uh, 40 uh, nouns in BIMI and 40 verbs. The uh, learning of the new vocabulary, the session of learning uh, lasted approximately 45 minutes in each of the sessions that we had. In the uh, with uh, our, regarding the material, uh, we created uh, a set of gestures as you can see here, the gestures were, were validated in a pilot study before the, is, uh, these two experiments. And we created lists of 40 uh, Spanish BIMI translations, the same number of, uh, as the gestures. So we had 40 gestures associated with 40 Spanish BIMI translations. About the learning programs, all participants learn the new words uh, along three consecutive days of learning and evaluation. And as evaluation, they did a forward and a backward translation tasks. The total duration of this evaluation uh, task was uh, 15 second, uh, minutes per day. So we had a total of three sessions of learning and evaluation. The learning lasted 45 minutes and uh, the evaluation only uh, 15 uh, minutes. Here you can see how it was uh, the procedure. Uh, this is an, an, uh, an image of the learning and the evaluation task. As you can see, the person performing gestures uh, was in the center of the screen. Participants could see the word in uh, the first language. In this case, uh, it was Spanish and the Vimi translation. They were uh, asked to repeat the pair of words on the screen twice. At the same time, they imitate the gesture also twice. I guess you remember this procedure. Then as evaluation task, they, as I said, they did a translation and a, a forward and a backward translation. 
uh, word was presented on the screen and they had to remember and to say aloud the translation in, in the other language. Here you have uh, the four gesture conditions we implemented in the experiment. As I told you, we had a congruent, incongruent, meaningless, and no gesture. And they were different between because the meaning of the word and the meaning of uh, the gesture match or not. In the case of the congruent condition, the meaning of the word was congruent with the gesture. In this case, we have shampoo tola, shampoo tola. That is what we did at the beginning. In the case of the incongruent condition, the gesture had a meaning, but it was not the meaning of uh, the word. Here we have, for instance, the word scissors, but participants were doing the gesture of shampoo. So this is incongruent. In the meaningless gesture condition, participants saw also the word in the first language. The example that you have here is shampoo, but they saw a meaningless gesture, a gesture without sense. For instance, touching the forehead and then the ear. Finally, we had a no gesture condition where only the L1 word and the second language translation were presented on the screen. No gesture here. So we have uh, we had a congruent condition, a match between the gesture and the uh, word meaning, and two conditions which uh, in which the gesture and the word meaning did not match. The difference is that in the congruent incongruent condition, the gesture also had a meaning, but in the meaningless condition, the gesture did not have a meaning. Before seeing uh, the results, if you remember at the beginning, I told you that one of uh, or one of our research question was to determine which of the different theoretical approaches that try to explain the role of gesture fix uh, better with the results. And here you have uh, some graphs in, uh, showing uh, the different predictions that each of these theories will have about all results. Here you have the self-involvement account. If you remember this theory supported that always that a participant perform a movement will be, will be an increase in attentional and perceptual uh, processes. So always they do a gesture, we are going to observe the learning improvement. Then the motor trace theory said that the important thing is to activate motor traces in memory. So always that a participant do a gesture, which is familiar for them, which is in all congruent and incongruent conditions. If you remember here, although the meaning did not match, the meaning of the gesture was clear also. So in these two conditions, which are gestures familiar to the participant, we will observe the learning improvement. Finally, the last theory, the motor imag imagery theory said that uh, we are going to observe only a facilitation effect when the gesture and the word meaning match. But this theory um, explains something else. And it is this theory predicted also that in the incongruent gesture condition, we will observe an interference in the learning process due to the mismatch between the gesture and the word meaning. So this theory supported a facilitation and an interfering effect. Well, and here you have the results of the NOMS study. Here you have uh, the sessions, the graphs with showing the sessions, first, second, third. Each of the graphs is for one of the translation directions. We have here forward and here backward. In blue, congruent, orange, incongruent, gray, meaningless, and yellow, no gesture. The order of the conditions will be always the same along the slides in all the graphs. So as you can see here, the more participants train, the more uh, they learn. So the learning results were better. The representation of recall was higher at the end of the third session compared to the beginning of the learning process in the first session. In addition, we also found a learning condition effect. 
and we can observe it in this other graph. Here you have also nouns, here forward translation, here backward translation. As you can see, what we could observe is a facilitation effect in both translation directions compared to the no gesture condition. So when participants perform gestures congruent with the meaning of the word, they learn uh, they uh, had a higher percentage of recall compared to not performing gestures. In addition, it was found the interference effect, but we found the interference effect in incongruent and in meaningless gestures. So um, uh, when there is not a match between the words and the gestures, meaning we are going to observe an interference. They are going to have a lower level of recall. And well, uh, this was all about the uh, gnomes experiment. And now let's see uh, the, uh, the results that will be for the experiment number two, that was the experiment with verbs. Exactly the same, but with verbs. Here you have the same type of graph showing each of the different sessions for the forward and backward translation directions. The results were the same at this point. We found the session effect, the more participants train, the more words uh, they remember. And again, we found the learning condition effect. Here you have uh, the results. We again found the facilitation effect associated with the congruent gestures compared to the no gesture condition. And here in the forward translation direction, we did not find the interference in the learning process. We only uh, found this interference in the backward translation direction, but not in the forward translation direction. When uh, the learning of norms and verbs uh, was directly compared, that was this second research question that we wanted to address, we observed that uh, gnomes in green, verbs in yellow, gnomes were always easier to learn than verbs, but not in the case of the congruent condition. In this case, gnomes and verbs reached the same level of recall. as a discussion of these two experiments, experiments one and two, uh, we can say that concrete gestures produced a facilitation in the learning process compared to the baseline without gestures. So uh, concrete gestures fostered the L2 semantic system mapping, reinforced the connection between the second language words and the semantic system. Taking into account the importance that uh, the congruency between uh, or the match between the gesture and the word meaning had in our experiments, we will say that the motor imagery theory will be the one which fits uh, better with our results. Although, if you remember, this theory um, supported an interference in learning associated with incongruent gestures and no with meaningless gestures. But in our experiments, we found both an interference in learning associated with uh, meaningless and incomplete gestures. Incongruent uh, meaningless gestures produced an interference in the learning process, probably because participants were exposed to a dual task situation. They had to learn a pair of words, a, a word, a translation in a foreign language. At the same time, they had to remember or reproduce also uh, a gesture which did not match in meaning with the word. So this is a dual task situation. When we compared nouns and verbs, verbs were always, uh, were not always, were harder to learn than nouns, although the congruent gesture eliminated this difference. And this will be probably due to the rich semantic motor, uh, motor semantic representation of verbs. 
Okay, now I'm going to present the third experiment with the title Seen or Acting the Effect of Performing Gestures on Foreign Language Vocabulary Learning. This work was also published in Le uh, Language Teaching Research. In this case, we, in experiment three, we are going to respond to the third research question, which is, if you remember the introduction, uh, I spoke about this stuff, uh, these uh, issues about comparing uh, self-performed movements and movements of observation. Here is where we are going to address this topic. So we are going to explore if self-performed gesture will have additional benefits to the mere observation of movements. Again, here you have the method. It is super similar to the method in experiments one and two. The only difference is that uh, we had two groups of participants. One of them performed, imitated the gesture of the that was that were presented on the screen, and the other group did not imitate the gesture and only observed the experimenter uh, doing it in this uh, in the screen. In uh, the C group, uh, we had 15 participants, and in the group, do group, we had uh, 16. As in the case of the uh, first study, the all participants were monolingual, and we also had 20, uh, 40 words that we pair with uh, 40, in this case, Spanish verbs. We use verbs here. This experiment also uh, lasted, this task also lasted about 45 minutes. Uh, we used the same gestures that we validated for the first study. And they also, all participants also learned here in three consecutive days of learning and evaluation. The learning and evaluation tasks were exactly the same to repeat aloud the material. In the case of the do group, imitating the gesture. In the case of the C group, only repeating aloud the pair of words. And well, here we have the results. Here you have the C group, here the results of the do group, uh, the same order of the conditions, congruent, incongruent, meaningless, no gesture, the same in this group, forward and backward translation direction. Same here, forward and backward. Comparing the C, the C and the do groups, you can, it is uh, super visual that the percentage of recall was higher in the do learning group compared to the C learning group, but this difference uh, was not significant, although it seemed to be. Concrete gestures again facilitated the learning process in general, in both experiments, in both groups. However, in the forward translation direction, which is more conceptually mediated, performing gestures eliminated the additional difficulty associated. So the interference effect associated with the incongruent and the meaningless gestures. So here in the forward translation direction, when participants imitated the gestures, we did not find the interference in learning. Yes, the facilitation effect we did, but no, the interference in learning. As conclusion of this work, we can say that movements seem to play a role in cognitive processes. The percentage of recall was higher in the do than in the C learning group. As I said, this is super visual, but uh, this uh, uh, difference was not significant. We were especially interested in the accuracy rates in all these experiments, but I can also say that in question of response time, the do group was faster, responded faster, had a facilitation in the access of information compared to the C group. Then in this study, we replicate the previous results about the facilitative role of ge congruent gestures and the interference associated with the incongruent and the meaningless conditions. The L2 learning facilitation, we can say uh, it is, uh, um, was independent 
to, of the training. So the mere exposure to the material in the C group was enough to add sensory motor networks to the meaning of the new words they were adhering. So we found independent, independently of independent, uh, independently of the uh, group C or do we observe the positive effect of the congruent condition. The negative impact, on the other hand, associated with the incongruent and meaningless gestures was reduced in the uh, do learning group. In previous studies, it has been shown that self-performed movements will reduce the working memory load uh, while learning, and our data can be interpreted in this way. The performance of gestures reduce the cognitive effort or the load in working memory due to this mismatch between the gestures and the worst meaning. So if we can choose, uh, we will recommend self-performed gestures during the foreign language learning program. Finally, I go with the fourth part, which is the general discussion and conclusion. It will be super fast. In these three experiments, we corroborated in um, that gestures favor the semantic processing and the establishment of links between the semantic system and the foreign language words. On the one hand, um, congruent gestures increase the semantic processing of the information, which is beneficial for the final learning outcome. When we compare nouns and verbs, when participants perform gestures which were congruent, the difficulty associated to the learning of verbs disappeared and the levels of recall were similar between nouns and verbs. And when we compare the do and the see groups, we observe in both cases the positive effect of the congruent iconic gestures. So the mere exposure of these gestures, only seeing them, they will create this mental representation that are integrated with the meaning of the words. On the other hand, when uh, the meaning of the word and the gestures are not congruent, as in or incongruent and meaningless conditions, we can observe the negative consequences of performing a double task. They were exposed to a dual task situation. In both conditions, incongruent and meaningless, nouns were easier to learn than verbs, due probably to the uh, semantic richness of this type of words. If you remember, I said that nouns are normally uh, acquired uh, earlier in the normal linguistic development, and uh, they are normally easier, in general, easier to learn uh, than verbs, at least in the research that we uh, found with children. Finally, uh, the gesture imitation uh, seemed to mitigate the negative effect of this meaning mismatch between the gesture and the word. And this positive effect of self-performed movements might be due to a reduction in the working memory load during the learning process. The final message could be, if you can choose, don't stare and do it congruent. As conclusion, the way in which we learn is super important. The learning method can produce important differences in the way we process or new language and the use of uh, gestures while learning strengthen concretely the links, the connections between the second language words or the, or the foreign language words and the semantic system. And this is a type of processing which is the one that fluent bilinguals do. Finally, learning a language is not as easy as rubbing a magic lamp, but it can be easier with the appropriate teaching method. Okay, uh, now, uh, if you remember, we did a literal experiment at the beginning. Um, now, do you think you are going to remember the words that you learned? So let's see now if you <laughs> learn these words. Uh, you are going to see a word on the screen. In this case, you are going to see the BIMI words. And let's see if you can remember the translations in English. 
Ready, steady, go. I'm gonna give you some seconds to remember the translations. Foine. This is guitar. Second one, tola. This is shampoo. Third one, lenope. Lenope is the big word for car. And last one, la mube. La mube is the translation for scissors. And well, it's all of my part. Uh, congratulations. If you remember uh, the words, you can say now that you uh, learn or know a new language. And thank you for coming and for listening.